Uh, it's deadline season. Again, you can listen all day, watch all day, Friday. Sportsnet's got a billion people coming into the building. Got the rundown yesterday, and it's like, holy crap. Always love when it's the one or two dudes that we're doing any media before deadline day and how it becomes this day where they start doing it. I'm like, all right. And I, I got, there's a couple of dudes that are going to be here where I'm like, oh, him, cool. <laughs> Maybe some even on the show. So stay tuned for that. Uh, a man who is on the show. Whoa. He's, he's in wind tunnels. Luke Fox, NHL and Sportsline. What's up, brother? How are we doing? I'm doing pretty good. Just walking to uh, morning skate for the big rematch against the Buffalo Sabres. Huge. Actually, I do love it. I got to tell you, I, even though the Sabres stink in perpetuity and it's just like, I feel as though, what, what year did the Leafs hire Babcock? I was like, oh, nine? No, got to be. No, later than that. What am I saying? Later than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, way later than that. Uh, what was that? 20, no, 15, 2016? Yeah. Yeah. No, there, fifth, well, Matthews was 16, right? Yeah. So, so they, they, had the, they had the tank, yeah. tank year before. Yeah. Right. Okay. So they brought him in and it was with the promise of, Man, this Sabres Leafs rivalry that they're gonna have. Yeah. It's like boy, oh boy, this is gonna be fun. And then last year the Sabres was at like moments of positivity and we're like, wait till you see the Sabres next year. And then it was they suck. They're so bad. They just they refuse not to suck. I don't know what it is. Something in the water doesn't seem to matter what they do. They just they cannot stop sucking. But they get up for Leafs games, and I really do believe, and we have the suspension, the Darlene suspension with Matthews, but I think Darlene and Matthews hate each other's guts, and they both add a little bit of fire to this game. I, I love this game tonight. Yeah, and well, and the Leafs have reason to get up for it because mm-hmm. they, they had their worst game of the Matthews, Marner, Nylander era before Christmas in Buffalo, mm. where they absolutely got shellacked and... Uh, broke Ilya Samson off and it was like embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they, uh, hopefully they get up for it. Um, the thing is it's sandwiched between the two Bruins games. Um, so you, you don't want them to have like a, a letdown night because they're more worried about trying to chase the Bruins or prove to the Bruins that they can hang with them. Cause they're going to uh, in all likelihood, that's their, their most likely um, first round opponent. So hopefully uh-huh. they don't, they don't take a night off tonight. Hey buddy. Uh, I don't, I don't I got to tell you, though, it, the Leafs just went on an awesome winning streak. They got everybody all excited, right? The vibes were high. Everyone's yep. going, they're buyers, they're buyers. They're definitely buyers. They're good. They figured out the three lines. They're good. They just need to write shot D. They're good. Samsonov is fixed. They're good. Keith is pressing all the right buttons. They're good. The energy is back in the building. They're good. They lost that game to the Bruins, and I looked at the schedule, and I saw Sabres-Bruins back-to-back, and I was like, there is nothing more Leafs than after getting all this confidence build up that the two last games before the deadline, they get smoked in both of those, <laughs> and that it spends the narrative into panic mode heading into Friday. Like, come on, you know that's the way this feels now. Well, that's a roller coaster, right? Yeah, it, exactly. It, 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 it's kind of hilarious, you know? Like, they, they lose to the Bruins, and it's like they just had – their best stretch of hockey of the whole season. Yeah. And all of a sudden the panic starts to creep in, right? Because it was the way they lost. It was mm-hmm. like, okay, they had the second best goalie on the ice. The special team mm-hmm. failed them. And it was like old traumas were getting dredged up um, just in, in the manner in which they lost. The big mm-hmm. boys didn't score. Yeah. No, it was, it was a playoff blueprint. And I think that was even the, that was the, um, the title of one of your articles, right? It was the Bruins provide blueprint or Bruins have the blueprint. Yeah. And they went, yeah. I was like, yeah, dude, that felt very blueprint ish. That felt very much like get the first goal on these guys, put them underwater early in a hockey game and make them feel it. And then just eliminate Matthews and Marner and check them really hard throughout the game. And boom, you got yourself a victory. And so, yeah, you know, some people will say the puck on the line and whatever, but no, that was a little too familiar. I would really, I think it would be, I, I actually think that the Wednesday game against Boston, even though it's the second half of a back-to-back, uh, it's got to be a little important for their psyche. It's got to be a little important even for the fan base. Just, hey, humanize them. Uh, make them look like they're beatable. Okay, so 
Uh, actually, you know, you just mentioned, no, no, I'll get to that. I'll go to this first. I just had Frank Cervelli on. I asked him to give me the odds that the Leafs trade for another defenseman. He said if it was gambling, he would put it minus 600 that the Leafs end up adding another blue liner, which is essentially for those of you at home, like that's a lock. That's like, uh, that's like the chiefs playing at home against the jets. Okay. Like that's, <laughs> you know, it's, that, that's, that's a big, 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 big favorite. Um, so you listed a bunch of the guys. Uh, by the way, he said that he felt as though it would be Dumba most likely, but you had a bunch oh. of guys listed. Yeah, he had a. He he was like, yep. Yeah, if he had to pick a favorite, a front runner, it would be Dumba. You had you listed all the names in your latest article, uh, which is up on Sportsnet.ca, and I would recommend people go and read it. Uh, it's just Maple Leafs trade deadline preview, biggest targets, needs, chips. Um, out of all the names you listed, if it was you, if you could choose, who do you think is the best fit realistically here? that they could got to be a name that you listed in your article. Well, uh, I, I mean, the thing is the, the, the guys that I think would be a great fit would be someone that is absolutely a top four defenseman and pushes other guys down. Mm -hmm. And though, and those guys to me have term. So like it, but those are bold moves. Like I'm thinking Adam Larson, Colton Pareko, mm -hmm. like someone like that, where you're not like, Oh, where does he fit? You know where he fits. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, it's you know the the GMs who have players with term. This is not the time for them. You you kind of have to blow their socks off with with what you're offering. Otherwise, you're just messing around with with the rental market, and you know then the names get into you know like a like a Matt Dumba, and they're not they're they're kind of flawed, right? So. Uh, realistically what are they going to do if they don't want to spend the, if they don't want to spend their first on a rental which is which is not their preference and to me the only rentals that may even be worth a first in the whole market are like Hannafin and Gensel and I, and that might be mm -hmm. it um, so if you don't want to spend your first on a rental and you don't want to spend Fraser Mint or Easton Count what are you giving up mm -hmm. um, which makes me uh, I don't know about concern, but realistically, they might be looking at the second tier type of guys yeah. because they've already they've already let their their best targets pass by. Like Elias Lindholm would have helped this team, Chris Tanev would have helped this team, and they let those guys go by. So it makes me wonder if you know we're they're looking for the second tier guys. Mm -hmm. No, I think that they are, and I, I'm getting to the point now where I keep mentioning this, and I've already mentioned it on the show, but I do it for the guests to kind of let them know where I stand. And everyone's like, we get it, dude. This is where you're at. To me, uh, I, I just, it, you mentioned those guys, like the, the first round pick they have this year and Fraser Minton. I'm not against the Leafs moving those pieces, um, but it has to be for what you said. And out of the names that you listed, like, I'm, I don't know if I want to give that up to acquire Colton Pareko's $7 million cap hit a season until he's 37 what, years old, you know? What, and about, then, what about 50% what about retention though? That changes then, things for sure. That definitely yeah. does. Because then if, if you're doing that, then you, like, yes, of course. Because if you, here's the thing. If Jake McCabe was making the money Jake McCabe is supposed to be making, people would go, sorry, you gave up what for him? But because of the retention and his flexibility salary-wise, people are like, I love this player. And that clearly matters to this market and it matters to their window. It also gives them just so much more wiggle room to be able to miss. But yeah, something like that, uh, that, that makes more sense to me if you ended up doing it. But boy, it just... There's something I, I kind of get their position in this just from this standpoint, you know, uh, you, you make these decisions that fa feel like it's a finality and that's tough, right? Like, of course you could always move somebody off the roster and maybe something crazy happens. And you say, you know, we're making nines available or Easton Cowan's available. But if you move Minton and that first round pick for somebody, it's like, that's the team, you know, it's done. There's no other moves you can make. There's no other places that you can really pull from to materially change the group. You're saying like, this is it. And I don't know for me anyways, I, if I was in their shoes, I can understand why that would be a bit scarier to make, even though this year's first and Fraser Minton aren't exactly like it's in a, on a normal team with normal amounts of assets. You would kind of say like, yeah, of course the, those two guys are expendable. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. It's like, you know, you're down to your last two bullets in the chamber. You yeah. gotta, you gotta be pretty, pretty sure what you're going to do or else you're, 
just start just throwing the gun and hope that works. Yeah, like this is a, yeah. this is marriage, you know. Like now you're married to that team in a way that you know it's just <laughs> there's no change and there's no optimism of change. It's just this is it, fellas. Get it done, Colton Pareko. That's your team. But the, the thing is, the reason why I say like they should look hard at guys who aren't rentals is because they're going to have to fill out a blue line next year. Yep. It's it's Riley. It's McCabe, and then it's, you know, you have a couple guys under team control. Lilligren and Benoit are RFA. But otherwise, you've got to fill out a blue line next year. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the, the free agents, it's all the same guys we're talking about. Yep. It's Sean Walker. It's Matt Dumba again. It's, you know, it's not as if there's this really rich crop of defensemen that if you don't find them now, you can go get them in free agency. Mm-hmm. You have to you have to fill out a blue line. So uh, they're going to have to get creative, whether it's between now and Friday or whether it's in June. But uh, this is this is an issue. Well, you know what, too, and this is to kind of punch a hole into my whole thought process, which has been, well, you know, don't move the assets because maybe a right shot D becomes available through a trade during the offseason or maybe there's a scenario. But it's like, when does that happen? You know, like when are teams like, oh, no, now this isn't the NBA. There's not as much drama. There's not usually as much player movement or dysfunction. And yeah, guys that all of a sudden flip on their organization and go like, hey, we want out of here. And so if you're trying to project forward and say, well, maybe someone will be, it's like, well, why would Seattle change their position on, say, like the Larsons of the world from now till to the off season? You know what I'm saying? Like thinking, oh, something better might come along down the line. Uh, there is an opportunity cost to that, which is the opportunity of trying to win and, and feel the better blue line this season. No, absolutely. And th- I mean, that's what makes it so tricky. There's just not enough quality to go around. And, you know, we were talking about Seattle. Another name there is, is Will Borgen. He has a really cap-friendly hit. But, he, again, he's another guy that uh, has another year under his contract. Mm-hmm. The, trick with, the trick with the Kraken is they're not in sell mode, right? This is a team that's just getting its legs. They made the playoffs last year. They're going to want a quick turnaround. So if you're Ron Francis, who is one of the most patient GMs uh, by nature, he's not the kind of guy that likes to – overhaul his roster he's very patient so if you're him and you trade adam larson even if you get a decent return it comes summertime you're not trying to rebuild you're trying to get back into the playoffs if you're the kraken you're who are you looking for you're looking for an adam larson type so i understand from the guys trey living's calling and talking to why they're they're not so eager to to make that move it's it's really tricky. Dude, you know what you're making me think? I saw Elliot on Spit and Chicklets, and he was talking about the potential for expanded playoffs. And my God, uh-huh. if you are a fan of the trade deadline, you cannot have that. Because one of my most infuriating things right now is exactly what you just talked about, which is the parody in this game is such that basically everyone looks at it the way Seattle is, right? They're going, yeah, you know, we suck and we're not making the playoffs, but we could be good next year. There's not outside the realm of possibility. Like we're right there. Like true rebuilds don't happen too often. There's not too many markets that can endure it. And you know, even you look at what Anaheim, San Jose, Chicago, and is there any, that, those are really the only teams, I guess Columbus ish, but Columbus was like kind of trying to be good. So they don't even really fit that same thing to me. There's not that many teams that are like willing to actually go, no, we're tanking and we'll rip assets out of here and we'll be bad. And, we'll let this extend over multiple seasons. And it, it just hurts the deadline because like you don't end up with that many sellers. Like nobody, who are the sellers right now? Who are the pure sellers? It's those teams. Yeah. Arizona, I yeah. guess. Bu- Bu- Buffalo is going to sell, but it, they don't have a lot of pieces that get you really right, excited. That's, that's right? it. But uh, they'll sell, but not anything of, you know, they're like, yeah, we'll sell, but the crap. We'll give you the yeah. crap. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good. No <laughs> extra teams. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so let's, are we done with the D? Are we done with the blue line? Cause it seems like we're kind of sure, in lockstep sure. here. Uh, are we lockstep? Okay. Oh, actually, hold on. One last thing on the blue line. This was the other thing I mentioned. Do you think that if they, so if they trade for Dumba, who you think's coming out? Because I think it's pretty conclusive after the Bruins game. Sorry, you, you cut out there. Who, if, who's coming out? If you, yeah, if you trade for a blue liner, right? You trade for a right yeah. shot D. Who do you think is coming out of the lineup for the Leafs? Yeah, are we going to have Timothy Lilligren in the press box again? Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred like, percent. This is going to come to a head, right? Just like it came to a head with Rasmus Sandin 
You know, Travis Dermott was supposed to be the guy, right? Remember, there was mm-hmm. a path paid for him, and he was going to oh, be yeah. top four. Mm-hmm. And then it then it was Sandine, then it was Lilligren. Th- these guys are going to eventually develop into a top four guy that we can't take out of the lineup. And this is it's probably under discussed actually how the Leafs have been unable to draft and develop defensemen that stick with the team. Mm-hmm. And you need and you absolutely need those guys. You need young, capable defensemen because. Especially the way the Leafs are, are top heavy with, with their forwards. Mm-hmm. And it feels like it's coming to a head. So, you know, he was pretty quick to agree to his contract last time, but he's going to want to raise. I mean, he's, he, his performance hasn't commanded a massive raise, but he's going to want to raise and he's going to have Arbrights in the summer. Mm-hmm. So at some point, and it, it may not be this week, uh, it probably won't be this week because I don't see his trade value being super high. But at some point, it's going to come to a head, and this organization is going to need to make a decision on Lilligren. And it, is he part of your future or not? Are you going to keep investing in this guy? Do you think he re- you really believe that his ceiling is that much? He's been wildly inconsistent. Uh, how much of it is the injury? I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. And then he had a second injury that they didn't want to talk about. They didn't want to say what it was. Mm-hmm. So it just raises more questions. Was it related to the ankle? I mean, I've asked him straight up, like, how's your ankle? And he's like, it's fine. So mm-hmm. I'll take him at his word. But his play and his confidence has been all over the map this season. And you're right. If you bring in, say it's Dumber or someone else, say it's David Savard, whoever, whoever you bring in, and he plays the right side, I don't think they're taking Labushkin out. They like the simple game he plays. Mm-hmm. Uh, they seem to really like McCabe on the right. And kudos for Jake because it's not his favorite thing to do, but he's done well with it. Um, Lilligren would be the odd man out. In yeah. saying that, in saying that, if you're if you if you're planning on making a deep run, which is the hope here, you, a, uh, an injury on the decor is almost inevitable. So you know he could get in, and they could need him. So this is what I find. Um... I don't want to say fascinating. That feels too strong. <laughs> that feels too strong for fringy NHL players. But what I do think is uh, somewhat interesting about the Leafs is that they have two guys that are basically the same guy in Lilligren and Nick Robertson, where you go, they, they've both gotten ample opportunity and all of the opportunity they get, they always leave you wanting. There's flashes, right? There's been games where Nick Robertson's ripping pucks towards the net and goaltenders are having to move out of position to make tough saves, and you're like, damn, that shot is nice. You know, that's a real asset. But then you play him for 15 games in a row, and by the end of it, you're like, see ya. You know, whatever. I guess you're around. And people go, well, you don't want to lose that for nothing. And I'm like, I kind of agree, because the Leafs aren't exactly deep on the left wing. They're not deep with secondary scoring. And there's a scenario come playoff time where someone gets hurt, and I would say, well, who should get the call up? And it's still him because there's no depth beyond him, right? So same thing with Lilligren. There's no depth beyond him. There's no, we saw it. It was, what was it? Raffi. <laughs> I can't even remember yeah. his name anymore. Matt. We got like, eight, yeah, yeah, we got like 28 articles on Raffi and it was Raffi, Raffi. What was his name? Raffi. I can't even remember. And I do a daily. Raffi, yeah. yeah it's yeah, like, Raffi. it's like, come on. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing beyond these dudes. You kind of need them for a run. So on the one hand, you can't really trade them because they're still integral to your depth, but you also can't really play them on a playoff roster. And both guys, I would imagine, are only going to grow in frustration to the point where it feels like the, the parting of the ways ends up either being for nothing or not amicably or for some underwhelming return. Yeah, um, I, I have to agree. You know, I, I was really impressed with how Nick Robertson took it this year, mm-hmm. not making the team out of camp. I think the, the previous training camp, it really bummed him out. Um, and then, you know, he, then he had to do the full rehab after the injury. Uh, but he was a true pro and I, I love his attitude and I have a lot of respect for the kid. Like his heart is in the right place. It's just the fits wrong. Yeah. Right. Like I, I think he's an NHLer, but he, right now he's probably an NHLer on a team where he can be second line left wing, get some power play minutes, use his best asset, which is his shot. And on this team, it's, it's where does he fit when everyone's healthy because he's not a fourth line player, right? He's just not. And they have guys that are are more willing and better suited to do that type of job. So as long as the Leafs top nine is healthy, he's the odd man out. But I agree with you. It's who's the next man up. I'd rather have Robertson than Alex Steves, you know, like, so, and, and the other thing is, 
um, like we were talking about with Lilligren, RFA, his contract's up. Mm-hmm. At, some, at some point, they need to make a decision on these guys. Do they give them raises? And that cuts into the cap once more. You know, we all know Nylander's uh, cap hit is going to spike. You know, do you want to keep investing in these guys? Or are you going to find a role for them? Or are you going to find a new home for them? Like, at some point, it, it comes to a head. With Robertson, I think it's conclusive what you just said, that he's not a fit in the top six here or even really the, the top nine. He's never going to get that power play time. He's never going to get the role that he should probably have. And he is the ultimate change of scenery player. I will say this about Robertson too, though. Out of Oh, we just lost Luke. That's the sound of goodbye. I love how when I'm on it and the guys behind the glass are like, what? It was, oh, wow. Out of all the hockey players I've gotten a chance to speak with over the years. Robertson is one of my favorites. Gets it. Mm. Like he is mentally. That's where you want a guy to be at. He's sharp, works hard, doesn't seem to have real gripes and complaints. And I, I, I just, I, I liked, I liked speaking to him and, and I felt as though, yeah, he had, Robertson has good perspective. So like I, I just, I would mirror what Luke has to say and Luke's around him way more than I ever have been. It's just, yeah, I think that he's a sharp kid. He definitely deserves a chance somewhere else. I think that he could have success somewhere else. The, the thing is, is that most Leaf fans would say, I think they live in fear of him going somewhere and having any type of success, right? Like if he's a 20 goal scorer, people freak out and go, oh no, not this. Uh, he's never going to do that here. Like I, I just do not think that there's a path to a uh, successful Nick Robertson in a Toronto Maple Leaf sweater. But yeah, what uh, what the hell are you supposed to do? Anyways, let's keep it moving. Uh, Luke is back, right? What's up, brother? We got yeah, you? Yeah. yeah um, okay, so yeah, just a couple more topics here that you have in the primer. Um, so we all agree the Leafs need another defenseman, and it looks like that's the area that they're shopping most aggressively in. Uh, again, though, it seems as though they are also monitoring the center market. And it's the, it's the same, it kind of a similar conversation to the other guys of like, okay, well, if you bring a center in, who's going out? Um, where do you think they're at internally when it comes to the feelings around Max Domi? Because right now he's the 2C, and I like the intangibles, and people like the idea, and they've been successful during most of his tenure there. But, yeah, the underlying numbers are pretty ugly. Sheldon Keefe has had a propensity not to want to play him in really meaningful moments. Uh, yeah, what, what do you think the – like, what's your read on – his job security in that spot. Yeah. Tenuous. Uh I'd say, um, Keith is not entirely thrilled with that group, Uh but he loves, uh, keeping Matthews and Marner together who have actually maybe outside the Boston game have played their best hockey over the last month. And they look fantastic. And he really thinks he's found something now that yarn crock, is healthy and joined Tavares with McMahon. He really likes that line. So it's kind of like he's not entirely satisfied with the Nylander Domi group. And, and that's because they can really only be used for offense. Defensively, they're a liability. Uh, every, you know, diehard fans have already seen the clips of some of their biggest mistakes over the last uh, week and a half or so. Uh, but he doesn't want to disrupt what's working, so he's trying to give this some run and see if they can fig- figure it out. He's had that line in for meetings just with the three of them to try and drill home. Uh, you know, they need to be playing a little bit smarter and safer without the puck. When they have the puck, he loves them, but you don't have the puck all the time. The other thing is that Nylander was talking about yesterday is he, he pretty much said we're guilty of extending our shift length too much. So when we're tired, um, we're not as good in the D zone, mm. whether, it's, whether it's mentally or whether it's just you're drained from the shift. And he's like, we have to be a little bit smarter and get off the ice and not try to extend our shifts. Because on the right side of the red line, that is a fun group to watch. Mm-hmm. But on the other side, they've lost the coach's trust. And they need to, they have some runway here. Maybe they can earn it. I think that was perfectly stated. Like, bang on. Uh, okay. You, uh, you're, you've you been a Samsonov guy. You're, you've, you've had a good pulse. I a don't good know feel. about that. 
No, no, not I like, like uh, rooting for I like him. The personality. I like the personality. For no, sure. I meant like you've been on top of the story. Like you know, oh, okay, you, okay. you've no, you've been you've been really understanding of what's going on there. Uh, but also, that kind of answers this question of how people around the team feel about him. So you're like, I'm not backing him. I th- I, I'm not. I'm not on his. I like the other guy. Uh, how do you think he handled not playing the Monday night game? Because Keith put it out as, hey, this is just the schedule, but he played his best game of the season against the Rangers. We've always wondered how he was going to deal with a goaltending battle because his best play has always come when he's not challenged. And, yeah, I think this is going to be a pretty interesting start uh, tonight. Yeah, I, well, what was interesting to me is, so the morning before the Boston game, Sheldon was kind of like, well, he kind of, duck the goalie question it was like well we got a busy week we got four Mm -hmm. games both both guys are going to play and he's like oh we're just going to play the calendar to me i'm like all right the boston game is is a should be a measuring stick game this is the team this is the team you're going to face if the playoffs started today Mm -hmm. this is this is a more meaningful game than the sabers game like i i think by starting wall it tipped their hand is this is the guy we want to be our game one starter. Now we have some, some hockey to play. And I, I do think they'll probably go with the, the hottest, healthiest guy uh, when that day rolls around, but there's no doubt internally, they, they want the guy to be Joseph wall, mm-hmm. but I think it's kind of funny at what they're doing here. It, you know, a lot of, a lot of teams, it's like you win, you're in ride the hot hand. Mm-hmm. Well, Sam's wool won. He came out. Samson off one. He came out. So it's. Uh, it, I, I think it's a. I think it's a competition. I think behind closed doors, the organization is rooting for the guy to be Wall. Uh, but I love the way Samson off performed against the Rangers. Same. I, I thought he was fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's, I think that man, if Samsonov can actually stay in the fight here and not just completely fall out of it given that the odds are stacked against him and that we all have the exact same questions about whether he has the mental fortitude to endure a battle like this. I, I think that would actually say a lot for him as a free agent this year, you know, like to other teams that he would signal, no, 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 uh, nothing's rattling me anymore. Like I overcame it. I've put it behind me because most of us, I would think feel the same way. And part of the reason that I'm guessing that they're rooting for wool. And I think most people are rooting for wool is that, there's really nothing that Samsonov can do that's going to ever make someone feel like if one bad one goes in during a game, that more bad ones aren't going to follow. Yep, I, you know? I agree. He, he's yeah, he's proven to be erratic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he it was only a couple months ago that he was at the lowest point in his career, if yeah. not his life. Yeah. Uh, and, but I also think there's a little bit of pride of Wolves, the guy we drafted. We drafted him. We developed him. We gave him a cheap contract. He's very cap friendly. We've we've invested. Ye- they've invested years in this guy's development. Mm-hmm. So way back when the the last time the Leafs played the Bruins in the playoffs, they brought Joseph Wool on those trips just to get a feel for the team, just to see what playoff hockey was like up close. Like they've been investing in this guy for years. They want him. To, they're rooting for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I would say that. Yeah, if if I was Wool, or sorry, if I was Samsonov, uh, again, I'm. I feel like I can relate to him because uh, I I think I'm a choker. <laughs> like I think I'm. I don't want to say you know they like, can say he's mentally weak, but I I am. I, I'll be mentally weak sometimes. I would hate it if I felt like the uh, organization was always like rooting for the other guy. That would be the hard part for me to overcome. Is like the feeling of no matter what I do they're always going to say the other guy did it better if it's even close to a draw. Um, you kind of threw this in here at the end of your article. Uh, but yeah, the geo on LTIR line. And it got me thinking, will we ever see him play for the Leafs again? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it, it, I would just be throwing a dart at the board, right? It's a concussion uh-huh. and, you, and you don't know every concussion is, is unique. Uh, I just, I love the character. I, I, I'd, I'd hate to think that that was his last shift Same. in the NHL. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. But yeah, it just, it, it was like when it happened, and then when I read the LTIR, I went, well, if he goes on LTIR, the odds are that he'd be out until the playoffs, and then I don't see him 
cracking the roster come postseason time, like taking the 40 year old guy and then putting him on the ice cold when they have four better left shot D than him, five better left shot D than him. Yeah. I, I could at least see the scenario. So yeah, I'm rooting against it as well, but yeah, it did. It kind of, it, it, it feels like there's at least a, a shot at that. Yeah. It's a, it's a possibility. I mean, Hey, the, the goal here is to go deep mm-hmm. and, and, you know, if he's your, your number eight mm-hmm. and you need him because Great. playoffs are attrition, then, you know, you, you wouldn't mind his experience mm-hmm. in a third pairing role. Uh, hey, Luke, thanks for making time, brother. Uh, enjoy morning skate. All right. Take care, JD. Thanks for having me on. See you, buddy. Luke Fox, uh, senior NHL writer for Sportsnet.